John 5. Um, and let me start with the story. A man was visiting in the Louvre Art Museum, <clears throat> and he went to the Mona Lisa, and he was standing there in the group, and he looked at the Mona Lisa and said, I don't like it. And the tour guide said, Sir, that painting is not on trial. You are. <laughs> I heard that so many years ago, and I always have liked it. How does judgment come to the world? How does a trial come to the world? Tonight, we're going to see Jesus doing things, and a lot of people assumed they had the right to say, we don't like it. We don't like what you're doing. As if we have the right to pronounce on the Mona Lisa. It doesn't meet my expectations. It's like that painting has proven the test of time. It exposes me, not the painting. And so the scribes and Pharisees. <clears throat> we don't like the way Jesus is operating. And this is when he gives his speech for judgment. I've come into the world. Not because I'm pointing the finger and sending you somewhere, although that may happen, but because you're just exposing yourself by how you're responding to me. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. <coughs> Let's read the story. Uh, we're going to stop at verse 29. I debated and debated how far to go, but... Let's try to take bite-sized pieces. John 5, verses 1 to 29. And the big question always for me in Bible study is, what is this about? So as I'm reading it, uh, and there's, like, I, I went several different directions on what is this about? What is this about? Uh, see if you can help me. Hopefully I get it right. Let's just read the story. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So last week he was in Samaria. Now he's come back to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, and the word is, I just have to make some comments, is, uh, it depends on what the meaning of the word is is. <laughs> uh, he doesn't say there was in Jerusalem. He says, there is in Jerusalem a pool named Beth Bethesda. Many commentators think, apparently, John was writing present tense, meaning the pool is there, meaning he had to have written before 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed. It's a pretty interesting technical sort of question. How do you date? How old is this book? When did John write it? But he seems to be saying, there's a pool in Jerusalem. You can go there and see it. He could have said, there used to be a pool in Jerusalem before it was torn down. Now let me tell my story. Anyway, these are interesting when you read commentaries. And the more you get to know scripture, it's like, that's, that's pretty interesting. All right, that's a sidebar. There is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Now, how many of you, if you're looking at your Bible, you have verse 3 and then verse 5? <coughs> Where is verse 4? Pretty interesting question. Uh, they, it's not a mistake. It's in the footnote because there's a debate in the manuscripts whether this actually is what John wrote or whether it got added pretty quickly after he wrote it. But it's sort of an explanatory comment. In the footnote it says, uh, some manuscripts insert, wholly or in part, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped first after stirring of the water was healed and whatever disease he and of whatever disease he had okay a superstition 
it's pretty easy to think that John wouldn't have written that as part of Scripture because it's like, ah, they say that if the water stirs, it's sort of like a lot of people think if you walk under a ladder, it's bad luck or it's like, but let's don't put that in Scripture. <laughs> I don't know, even if it's a, but okay, trying to read the story. Um, so Jesus, we've seen him hang out at a wedding. We've seen him go to the temple where he got upset because things weren't right. We've seen him hang out with the Pharisee named Nicodemus. We've seen him hang out with a woman of questionable repute at a well in Samaria last week. And now he's hanging out with, and my translation is invalids. And just think of that word, invalid. You're not valid. These are the castaways. These are the sick, the broken, the blind, the paralyzed. And the word, the word paralyzed literally means withered, the dried up. The people that are... Why would he go there? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> it's like, why would he go there? And it's clear he's in charge. He's going where he intends to go, and he's going to find one man in where must be a hundred sick people. He doesn't go to 99. He chooses one, and we're not even told the man said, Jesus, come over here. He just says, you. All right, here we go. Verse 5. One was there who had been an invalid, who had been invalid for 38 years. Going to come back to that number in a moment. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said, Want to get well? <laughs> Why would you ask a man who's been sitting 38 years on a mat if he wants to get well? Hold that question. Verse 7. The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. I think he just said, I want to get well, but he didn't just say, I want to get well. I just love scripture, because it's like, is that a yes? Sort of. It's, it's enough of a yes for Jesus to act. But I'll tell you one of my conclusions. I'm not at all impressed with the man that's healed. You read this story, he just, it, he's not a great specimen of humanity. He's just sort of a, there. All right, verse 8. Jesus said to him, three commands. Get up, take your bed, walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. One other piece of information. Now that day was the Sabbath. And that's the most important piece of information in the whole story. That happened on a Sabbath. So, the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he said, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. <laughs> he doesn't even know his name. They said, who's the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you're well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man then went away and told the Jews. <laughs> it's like, don't do that. They don't, they're going to kill him. This, this man is questionable. That it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus said, my father is working until now, and I'm working. 
This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. So then, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whoever He will. I choose that one. This is a little troubling. There's a lot of sick people here, but I've chosen one. To whomever He will. Verse 22. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears My word and believes Him who sent Me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. How do dead people hear anything? Lazarus did. We're going to get to that story in a few chapters. Hey, Lazarus! Somebody said it's a good thing he said Lazarus or everybody in the cemetery would have gotten up. <clears throat> but the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have life in Himself. And He's given Him authority to execute judgment, because He is the Son of Man. We're going to come back to that title. Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming when all who are in their tombs will hear His voice and come out and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. <coughs> All right. What do you think the passage is about? Let me just let you give me a little feedback. The sovereignty of God. Who said that? Yeah, Paul. Yeah. There's a lot in here about sovereignty. He chooses the man he chooses. He doesn't... He's not, um, and then he talks about judgment. Lo, he comes with clouds descending. Yeah. What do you think it's about? Yes, Roger. Mark. <laughs> and he's intentional about it. This is not an accident, or this is not, oh, I didn't know you were going to take it that way. I mean, I, I get the impression he's intentionally hanging out with a bunch of invalid people. I love that word, invalid. It's so cruel. I mean, I say I love it. It's, they're invalid. Society says, no, get them out of here. That's where he goes on the Sabbath and chooses a man and makes him walk. And then the Jews arrive and they say, you can't do that. You're not supposed to do it that way. Who do you think you are? And, God's, and I think Jesus says, that's exactly the conversation I've wanted to provoke. 
judgment has come, and judgment is happening right now. It's not just future. The hour is coming. It's now here. When dead hear and alive people don't hear, and lame walk, and those who walk are impotent. I mean, it's, judgment is happening right now. I don't like the Mona Lisa. Sir, you're the one on trial. Yeah. Yes, no, please. Exactly. No, and, and he's intentional. I mean, and that's where he's sovereign. He's not just reacting to people. He is provoking, provoking this. I think intentionally. Let me dive in. Here we go. This story, like all the stories in John's Gospel, has multiple layers of meaning. The challenge in preaching or teaching from this passage is choosing which angle to emphasize. I almost chose the angle of Sabbath. I almost chose to just, this, this is, nobody said this is about the Sabbath. But this, this is, that's one of the things it's about, big time, Sabbath. Um, but the way I'm doing it, again, when you teach this, you can do it the way you want to do it. But when I get to teach it, I get to choose at least the angle that I think actually is the main angle. This study will focus on John 5, 17 as the key verse through which to interpret the entire passage. Where Jesus, Jesus says, when they said, you can't do this on the Sabbath, he says, my father's working today, Sabbath. And I am working. That's the blank. I'm working. This is why I've come. I'm doing my job. I'm working. And I've called this working on Sunday. Of course, Sunday should be Sabbath, technically. But we used to get concerned about people working on Sunday. That sort of has disappeared, unfortunately, from our culture. But uh, So let's look at the angle, look at the story through this prism. My father is working. I'm working. <clears throat> a quick look at some of the references in John to work is instructive. I just pulled out my concordance uh, actually this morning and looked up the word work in John. It's a very important word. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This was last week, sitting at the well with the woman from Samaria the disciples bring food, and they say, aren't you hungry? And he says, no, I've been doing the work, and that's my food. This energizes me. I'm doing the work that my father does all the time. Uh, second bullet, they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? That is a great question. And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe. Have you ever thought of belief as a work? Usually we make those opposites and say, no, you either believe or you work. Not Jesus. He says, no, this is the work. This is the work to believe. That's, that's pretty profound. Third bullet. Jesus answered, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. There's an urgency about the work. What's that? That's a real interesting answer. Oh, there, yes. But there's an urgency, even about the man at the pool. Night's coming. And while it's day, we've got to work. The next bullet. The Jews answered him, it's not, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. In other words, your works tell us who you are. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. If on the Sabbath... I go to an invalid person and say, you're valid. 
said, that tells you who I am. And they said, you're making yourself out to be God. And I think Jesus just smiled and said, I think he just smiled. Yeah, I said, you're getting it. And Jerusalem just sort of trembled. It's like, who are you? Still reading it. Who, do we know who the baby in the manger is? Who, what child is this? Um, and then in his high priestly prayer, Jesus prays back to his father, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work. Mission accomplished. This is just my comment on this. B. For Jesus, doing the Father's work was the single driving passion of his life. My Father's working and I'm working. This makes me tick. And as long as it's night, uh, as long as it's daylight, and as long as my mission's not complete, I'm going to show you who I am by looking at God, seeing what he's doing. That's what I do. It's like, what an interesting way to describe it. If we are children of God, then we should learn from Jesus' example and seek to imitate his thoughts, his words, and his actions. In other words, Jesus is our model. Just like he walked among the invalid people, he's giving us a clue. Now, if you're going to do the works, this is the work of God that you believe, that you follow the model. Henry Blackaby, has anybody thought of him yet as I've talked about this? Uh, how many have done experience in God? Yeah. This was the life, the, sort of a life-changing moment for many of us when he, in that study, Henry Blackaby emphasized this principle in his book, Experiencing God, when he said, watch and see where God is working and join him. I can still sort of remember, I said, that is so good. And the question is, how do you know what you're supposed to do in life? How do you know the will of God? How do I find my place? And Blackaby's way of praying it, and he based it on John 5, was just find out where God is working and joining him. And if he's down at Bethesda with all the, with all the rejects, go there. Uh, and this is, these are really the verses that inspired Blackaby. It's what I just read. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. And I think what this means in John chapter 5 is, Jesus got up that Sabbath morning and the Father said, I'm working down at the pool of Bethesda. You want to come along? And Jesus said, okay, what are you going to do? He said, well, come on, let's, let's see it. Because that's where my action is. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. Okay, examining the scripture. There's two parts. Um, the word sign is an important word in John. This is really the third sign in John, if you're counting them. There's seven, technically. Turning water to wine. The healing of the nobleman's son, which we didn't study. We skipped over. And now the healing of the paralytic. But it's a sign. And the sign is this. Jesus chooses one man, a lame man, for 38 years with questionable faith. <laughs> he heals him and tells him to carry his bed on the Sabbath. Now, if that's a sign, the question is, what does it point to? Because a sign, like a sign on the highway, points to something. What's it signifying? A sign signifies, signifies. What does the sign signify? I'm suggesting three things. That Jesus gives life to whom he chooses. That Jesus judges the world. And that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Those seem to be the big, the big themes. Um, a few notes on the text and then we're going to get into the good stuff. 
I've already mentioned the present tense of is. Makes some scholars wonder if the Gospel of John was written before 70 A.D. B is a very interesting. These are just sort of sidebar comments. The fact that John tells us the man had been an invalid for 38 years may be significant. I don't, I'm not one to too quickly make numbers mean things, but this one intrigues me. This is precisely the number of years the Hebrews wandered in the wilderness, referring to a disobedient generation under God's wrath. And in Deuteronomy 2.14, it says they wandered for 38 years. It doesn't say 40 years. We usually say 40 years. Technically, it took them two years to get from the Red Sea to the border of Canaan, Kadesh Barnea. That's when they had the rebellion. And God said, fine, if you don't want to go into the land of Canaan, you just do laps for the next 38 years. He'd been an invalid 38 years. And he represents Jerusalem, a disobedient generation. The light of the world has come, but the darkness doesn't get it. Uh, C. Yeah, parts of verses 3 and 4 are not included in the manuscript. These verses allude to a superstition that explains the popular belief in the healing powers of the waters. And John just doesn't even go there. He just says, some people believe that, but... Okay, D. This was not the only time Jesus was accused of being a Sabbath breaker. This was a recurring issue between Jesus and the Pharisees. But this was maybe the biggest one. E. The Pharisees were often guilty of keeping the letter of the law but violating the Spirit of straining out a gnat, but swallowing a camel. You got to look this up. Look up Matthew 23, 23. You just, because you get a, what the Pharisees are doing, I mean, think about the picture. Jesus walks into a rehab hospital, <laughs> Cardinal Hill, and he sees a man and he says, walk. The man starts walking. 38 years he's been in Cardinal Hill. And he starts walking. The Pharisees come up and they, their first response is, you're not supposed to do that. It's, you should have done that on Monday. It's like, what? what? Is that where you even start? And what law is he breaking anyway? We're going to get to that. What law is he breaking? by carrying a mat after being healed. But look at the Pharisees are Matthew 23, 23. Um, you have to love this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You tithe mint, dill, and cumin. Now these are spices. So when you use your spices, you take a tenth of it and put it aside and say that's for God. Mint dill, and cumin. Pretty impressive. But you've neglected weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. <laughs> it's like, oops, <laughs> oops. Uh, you know, they are masters in the art of missing the obvious. They tithe their mint, but they forget about mercy, justice, and faithfulness. It's like, and then he says, these you ought to have done without neglect, neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. In other words, when they strained their drinks through a cloth, they would be sure to get all the impure bugs out. He says, well, you did that really well, but you ended up swallowing a camel. So hoofs and legs sticking out of your mouth. It's just a, he's poking fun at them saying, come on, come on. Do you understand what Moses is even about? And in the next chapter, he's going to say, at the judgment, Moses is going to condemn you, the one you trust in. Moses will damn your soul. I mean, I, 
because you've, you've, you didn't understand the one you claim to study. That's what it means to be a Pharisee. Adventures in missing the point. <laughs> uh, perhaps the most poignant illustration in John is when the Pharisees refused to enter Pilate's house during Jesus' trial, lest they defile themselves and not be able to eat the Passover. I don't know if you remember that passage, but during the trial of the second person of the Trinity, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Jews take him to Pilate, who's going to judge him, but they say, but Pilate, we can't go in your house because, you know, we're Jews and we're staying pure for the Passover. And they're turning over the Passover lamb. It's like, can you really be that blind? And there are people on the pews of churches every Sunday who are that blind. F. John 5.27, Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. In Son of Man, that's the blank. In describing his role in the final judgment, this title comes from Daniel and refers to his identity as King of Kings. Uh, he's already been called Son of Man in chapter 1, and I, I didn't remind you of this, but this is what Daniel says. I saw in night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a... Son of man. That's where the phrase come from. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that all peoples and nations and languages should serve this Son of Man. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus, his favorite designation for himself was the Son of Man. And it comes from Daniel. There's a lot more we can say about that. But. Um, and the text, G, explains that final judgment will be based on works. Leon Morris comments, It puzzles some Christians that final judgment is linked with our deeds when the New Testament is so insistent that our salvation is all of God's grace. But while the New Testament always regards salvation as springing from grace, it just as consistently sees judgment as proceeding on the basis of works. That's a pretty strong statement. And there's a lot of theology there. And there's a lot of confusion among evangelicals about, am I going to be judged by my works? Or does that not matter when the saints stand before God? Um, let me just leave you with the question. And uh, there's, there's other verses we could look at, but I really liked the way Leon Morris said it. It said, this is not a denial of salvation by grace, but you'll know them by their fruits. You'll know them by their fruits. Okay, we have 20 minutes. Um, and this is... What I want us to do, working the works of God, based on that verse 17, my father is working until now and I am working. So what does it mean to work in the kingdom of God? That's our question. What does it mean to do God's work? What does it mean to work in the kingdom? This is important, not only in understanding Jesus, but in understanding ourselves as disciples. So if I'm going to do God's work, what does it look like? Well, this, that's what this is about. A. Uh, A and B are sort of introductory. Redeeming our concept of work. After sin entered the world, work became associated with toil, fatigue, stress, anxiety, heavy burdens. If you remember Genesis 3, thorns and thistles appeared, and the sweat of his brow, Adam worked. Before the fall, Adam and Eve worked the garden. They worked. They were gardeners. But it wasn't toil. It wasn't the sweat of your brow. Can you imagine life where work was what God intended? Um, 
However, because Jesus was without sin, His work had none of these qualities. He worked like His Father worked. And Genesis 1 and 2 is God the Father worked in creating. And you've got, you got to believe God had a great time creating the universe. I mean, this is, a, is he, like any artist, loves their work. And when on the seventh day he rested, it wasn't because he was tired. <laughs> it was because he was holy and he just wanted to take a pause. I, I don't even know how to fully explain it. But it's not fatigue that wore him out. It was just, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, um, and that's Jesus, the Son of God. So when he's walking there into Bethesda, working, I don't think he's saying, oh my goodness, look at all the sick people. I can't believe, what am I going to do? Where am I going to start? I, you know, it's like, how did he do that? Because that's how I respond to it. Uh, while it was indeed work for Jesus, his yoke was easy and his burden light. His yoke is easy. Remember that in the Messiah? Handel got all these verses right. He got him into the Messiah because he understood this is who he is. And his work reveals his identity. Our work should be the same because it is based in the fundamental truth that our primary work is to believe. <laughs> it's not to do something, it's to believe something. To believe that God can do something even through me. But it's not me doing it, it's Him doing it. Therefore, I may go to bed tired at night, but it's not like, wow, I'm so glad this day's over. It's like, wow, this was the day that God did some amazing things. I, I'm just... Okay. B, a watchful eye. Jesus did not create his own work. He didn't get up in the morning and say, hmm, I wonder what I'm going to do today. He kept his eye on the Father and simply discerned where the Father was already at work and joined in. As in chapter 4, when he had to pass through Samaria, we saw that last week, so in this chapter, Jesus is very intentional about where he goes, what he does, who he works with, and when he does it. So I, I've got to believe, if I get the context right, the father just sort of whispered to the son, I'm working down at Bethesda today. And Jesus said, all right. And he walked in, and the father said, I'm working in that invalid today. Jesus said, okay. And, and it's not just the who, it's the when. And if Jesus said, but Lord, it's the Sabbath. I think the father winked at him and said, you got that right. Let's do it. Because we're going to provoke something here. It's very intentional and very beautiful. And it's not led by Jesus, it's led by the father. My father's working, and I'm working. He looks where his father is already at work and gets involved there. All right. So if, if this was my sermon, I've got seven points in my sermon. And everything was introduction. So what can we learn from Jesus' work that will help us in our work? I'm so glad you asked. I got just... And I had to make it the number seven. It just sort of seemed the right number. Number one, and I, I sort of can't get past number one. He is working among the invalids. Now, that's not the only place he worked. He spent time with Nicodemus. He spent time with the woman at the well. He spent time in other places. But I love the fact that that Sabbath morning, the father said, Let's go to Bethesda. He's working among the invalids. Jesus intentionally visited the pool of Bethesda where there was, quote, a multitude of invalids. And I looked up these Greek words, but the Greek word invalid literally means strengthless. They're people who have no strength. 
They're impotent. They can't walk. They can't move. They can't see. They just, they, they're strengthless. And there's a multitude of them, as there are today. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And that word paralyzed in the Greek means dried up, withered. What a strong term. And again, you go to Cardinal Hill, you go to nursing homes, you go to the hospital, you go to prisons where we put our invalids away. And we think, God would never be in a place like that. You know, and I thought of Janine Brabon today. You ask Janine Brabon where God shows up. She'll tell you, in the hell holes of Medellin, Colombia, in the prisons of the drug cartel, there's revival going on. And uh, you, you know Janine Brabon? Some of you do. Um, when he visited the temple... God seemed to be absent. And this just, now remember two weeks ago, he visited the temple. You would think God would be sort of working there. <laughs> you have to love the gospel. It's just, it's like Jesus took a whip and said, I don't even know where God is in the temple, in the house of God. But down at Bethesda, he's, he's up to something. But somehow Jesus knew God would be present and active at Bethesda among the broken. Broken. I just used the word broken. I, lo I like that word, the broken people. And I don't think I've got a reminder group like this. They're out there still. And God, if you're listening, will tell you I'm up to something. And it may not be in church. In fact, it's probably not in church. <laughs> okay, second point. What can we learn from how Jesus worked to help us work? The first point was he's working among the invalids. Second point, he's working to expose motives. Jesus' question, do you want to be healed? So when, he, when he's at work, he's looking at people like us in the eye and say, let's get in touch with those motives. There you're on your mat. You spent 38 years there. Would you like to walk? At first, Jesus' question seemed silly, even hurtful. But upon reflection, we discover what a penetrating an insightful question it is. Jesus knew the human heart very well. And he knew that not everyone wants to be healthy and whole. That is a fact. I've experienced it in my own life. Uh, just, I had this thought today when I, this is maybe too personal. When I had my heart attack, this was two and a half years ago. But I, that next day, when the crisis was passed, but I had these nurses, oh my goodness, they were good to me. And, uh, they, I, but I, I had the thought that I had never had in my life that this entire hospital exists to meet my needs. <laughs> I mean, there's hundreds of people. And if I press my button, I, I've got everybody's attention. And it felt so good. I said, I've never felt, I, I'm not sure I want to leave. Listen to how Mark Buchanan says it. I tried to sort of find my words, but I leaned on somebody who writes better than I. Um, maybe his sickness had become his haven, his lover, his overlord. He's been there 38 years, 38 years of monotony, Futility, self-pity, poisonous envy, and secret pride of never being able to work, travel, make love, cook, care for children, or fix an ox cart. 38 years of life without options and without obligations. And then Jesus shows up and changes all that. Now the man can work and pay taxes. <laughs> Isn't that great? 
You want to pay taxes? Now he can marry and take on domestic responsibilities. Now he can build a home and fix its roof when it leaks. Now he can relinquish the unique status of suf that suffering bestows and enter the anonymity that comes with being well. Isn't that a great sentence? Welcome to the world of the healthy where we don't even know each other. But if you're sick, we put a name on you and we, we sort of, the whole hospital exists for you. Now he can lose the strange privilege of sickness and take up the everyday obligations of health. He's just like everybody else now, and we expect things from him. Do you want to get well? Do I want to get well? Mark Buchanan's a good writer. Let's keep moving. I'm watching the clock. The question is, what can we learn from Jesus' work to help us in our work, to help us do the work of God? And I've suggested, one, well, he's working among the invalids. Two, he's working to expose people's motives. Do you want to be well? Let's, let's get in touch. Thirdly, he's working on the Sabbath. The Jews took the fourth commandment very seriously. Historically, one could say that not only did Israel keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath kept Israel. I mean, circumcision and Sabbath observance, probably if you boiled it down to what's kept Jews Jews for 3,000 years, it's circumcision and Sabbath. And you break the Sabbath... You are, you are going to the core of the identity. And they would, that was a capital offense. You could, you could be stoned for breaking Sabbath in Jewish understanding. <laughs> I'm not going there. That's, that's, it. that's good. That's, that's interesting. That's good. B, the fourth commandment simply said, I went back and read it, go back and read the fourth commandment, uh, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, and then there's a short paragraph, but it basically says you shall not do any work, or your manservant, or your maidservant, but it says you shall not do any work. But it doesn't define what that means. It just says you shall not work. Enter the Pharisees. <laughs> they say, we'll tell you what that means. We'll tell how many feet you can walk in a day, how many pounds you can carry. We can tell you for what reasons you can get your ox out of a ditch if he falls in and what reasons you can't. They have, and they had books and books and books and books of tradition. Not law, but tradition. And Mark was getting at this a while ago. Did Jesus break the law, the fourth commandment? Or did he break the Pharisees' tradition? And my conclusion, and I think John's, no, he didn't break the law. He didn't break the Mosaic law. Jesus said, I didn't come to break the law. I came to fulfill the law. But the law does not say a healed man can't carry a two-pound mat <laughs> on the Sabbath day out of the joy of being set free of 38 years of paralysis. Where does it say that in Moses? It doesn't. Jesus did not break the law. He broke the Pharisees' understanding of the law. Big, big difference. The fourth commandment simply said, you shall not work on the Sabbath without specifying what that meant. Jesus healed a man and told him to take up his bed and walk. Jesus is not breaking the commandment, but he is breaking the Pharisees' tradition. Later in chapter 7, listen to this, uh, he said about this miracle. If on the Sabbath day 
a man receives circumcision. So Jesus is quoting Moses now. Okay, Moses said you're supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day. I think it was. So what if your baby's born on Friday and then eight days later falls on a Sabbath and somebody's got to do the work of circumcision? Moses said the eighth day, but you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. So what do you do? Well, the Pharisees were experts in coming up with answers for this. But if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? And then he said, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. I mean, what Jesus is saying, he said, you want to, you want to talk about what it means to break the Mosaic law? I'll be happy to have that conversation with you, Mr. Pharisee. I'll be happy. There's a man who's walking. And you think Moses is not interested in a man walking? Anyway. See, though Jesus did not break the Mosaic law, he did challenge the traditional Jewish notion of sacred time. And I almost did my whole study tonight about this, Sabbath, feast days, seasons. In chapter 4, last week, he challenged the notion of sacred space. The woman at Samaria said, is it on this mountain or in Jerusalem? And Jesus said, no, 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 it's not about location. It's about spirit and truth. In chapter 5, the question is, isn't worship better when we do it on Sabbath? when we get the time right. And Jesus said, no, 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 it's not about time. It's about spirit and truth. Here in chapter 5, Jesus is showing that God is not so interested in when we worship, but in the inner state of our hearts. Um, wow, I'd love to say more about Sabbath. But number four, hey, we've got to do this. A third thing we can learn about Jesus from Jesus about work is he is working to explore the relationship between sickness and sin. And I'm sorry I saved this for so late in the evening. We're not going to talk about it. But when Jesus told the man to sin no more that nothing worth may happen to you, he was implying, at least for this man, a direct relationship between his paralysis and his sin. Later, when Jesus heals the blind man in chapter 9, he explicitly said that for the blind man, the disease had nothing to do with his sin. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus said neither one. The point is, the relationship between sin and sickness is complex. And Jesus heals the lame man because he wants us to think deeply about the connection between sin and disease in our lives and the lives of those we love. That's big. Um, alcoholism may be the direct cause of cirrhosis of the liver. Cause and effect. Sin, disease. STDs. AIDS may be the direct cause of promiscuous activity. But what about a whole bunch of other sins? Depression or um, anorexia. You know, what is disease? What is sin? And we could go down a whole list of uh, bipolar disorders, obsessive compulsives. Um, I, could, I could... What is... I think what... I'm learning in John is Jesus just wants us to prayerfully think deeply. Lord, what about my body? What about my soul? How do they influence one the other? There's not a simple connection. Um, I finished. Number five, six and seven. He is working to reveal his true identity. He's making himself equal with God. Number six, he's working to judge. Um, and let me give you seven. 
Skip down to 7. He's working to bring life. I think I'm, I'm leaving a lot of good stuff out and I'm raising more questions than maybe I'm answering. But I, th I think what I'm wanting us to leave with is Jesus said, I'm, my Father's working, and I'm working. And my work is the model for your work. And so I think these seven principles, what I call them, what can we learn? That how does Jesus work? He works among the invalids. He works to expose motives. Do you want to be well? He works on the Sabbath, but with an understanding of sacred time that is not limited to one day of the week. He works to explore the relationship between sickness and sin. He works to reveal his identity. Who is Jesus? He works to judge. For judgment, I've come into the world. And then, really, the main thing he's doing is he works to bring life. And we're going to see this, especially when we get to chapter 11. And Lazarus is not just sick. He is dead as a doornail. Four days in the tomb so that he stinketh. <laughs> he's dead. And, Master, it's too late. I would hoped you would get here earlier but I know that not even you can do anything in this situation. Jesus said, that's why I came late. Um, pretty good stuff. Let me pray. Lord, we pray that you'd help us sort through what all this means, not just to have a bunch of notes in our notebook, but what it means tomorrow morning when we get up and we try to discern where you are working. So we can just get on board and join in. Lord, thank you that Jesus is such a model for how to do the work of the Father. Dismiss us with your blessing. Speak to us even while we sleep. In Jesus' name and for the sake of the kingdom we pray. Amen.